Hello and welcome back CISSP wannabes. I am Mia Weaver and today my daddy has not one, but two questions for you to ponder and think about today. So let's get right to it. Was that not awesome? She's the coolest. All right, here comes question number one. All right, a lot of words in this one again. Uh, you've just learned that several of your developers' notebooks have been infected with information stealing malware. Now, you believe that the, infection, the, uh, the vector of infection, the way they got infected, was through the use of banner ads and a third-party website that's popular with your, um, with your developers. My question to you is, is when somebody gets infected in a way like that, what type of an attack is that? Um, here's some answer choices for you to think about. When you're ready, go ahead and click pause, but when you're ready, click play again, and then we can go in and break each one down. All right, choice number one says spear phishing. This is no, that's not the right answer. Spear phishing is most commonly associated with people using email to send you uh, specific attacks targeting you individually to try and go in and get you to believe something and click on something and do something bad. So this is not an example of a spear phishing attack. Choice number two was social engineering. Nope, this wasn't social engineering. This was an instance where you had some people in your shop visit a website and their junk got infected. So nobody social engineered them to do this. It just happened because they visited a website. All right, choice number three, that's the one that we're looking for. This is a watering hole attack. A watering hole attack is an attack where people don't go after you directly. What they do is they go after the places where you hang out. So in this instance here, we've got a situation where all your developers go to a popular website that's probably something related to uh, something that is you know, associated with their work or something like that. And uh, the attacker has gone in and, and purchased ad space on this third-party website and then use those banner ads when they pop up to actually insert malicious code and get that code to execute on your visitors or on the visitors of the website system and that causes the infection to take place. Uh, so this is an all too common kind of scenario. In fact, there's a link that I put down in the comments below that offers a real life example of how this having happened uh, to Forbes.com. Um, and believe me, Forbes isn't the only person to whom this has happened. But um, it's just an example of it, of, of it in the real world of how it can actually take place. And the last two choices on here, buffer overflow and rootkits, nope, those are just there to distract you. This uh, description, what I gave you right here, is pretty much a textbook definition of what a, uh, a watering hole attack is. All right, question two. You work for a small business that has chosen to implement WPAPSK for its wireless LAN. You want to defend against an attacker capturing the authentication exchange for one of your legitimate users and then taking that and attacking that authentication exchange offline. Okay. Now, you currently use a 10 character pre-shared key that is, uh, just uses uppercase and lowercase letters. My question to you is, which of the following options is going to allow you to better defend against somebody doing an offline attack against your pre-shared key authentication? Go ahead and click pause, think about it, and then come back and we'll break it down. All right, first answer on the list says that you should switch from AES-128 to AES-256. Not the right answer. Okay, there's a couple reasons it's not right. One, because the standard implementation of a wireless LAN security is, as far as being industry standard compliant, just uses AES-128. So switching to AES-256 isn't an option. You're typically gonna be looking at a third party solution if you're gonna to wanna to go and do that. And even if you did, it's not gonna fix your problem because the authentication exchange is done out in the open before encryption keys are actually generated. Second choice on the list says that you should leave the pre-shared key at 10 characters in length, but include additional character sets. So use uppercase, lowercase, alpha letters, numbers, and special characters. Okay. Now, this is not the right answer. But let me get to this other answer choice so we can kind of talk about the two at the same time. Um, so let's go ahead and look at those. The third choice in here is just to distract you again. It says that you should switch uh, and use bcrypt rather than pbkdf2. Uh, pbkdf2, it stands for the password-based key derivation function. Um, both bcrypt and pbkdf2 are both key stretching techniques. 
However, the standard implementation of WPAPSK uses PBKDF2, and I'm not aware of any instance out there that you have an option to go in and switch to bcrypt, so, um, or, or even that you would necessarily want to. I'm, right now, I wouldn't try, try and argue the merits of one versus the other. But uh, suffice to say that in any of the implementations that I've come across, uh, you can't switch from bcrypt to PBKDF2, so it's not really an option for you to do So That's not the correct answer that we're looking for. I'm going to skip over the fourth answer, which is actually the right answer, um, just to get these other last two ones out of the way. Uh, the one says that you should switch use to using WPA2 from WPA1. Um, these are keys are going to be attackable whether you're using WPA2 or WPA1. It doesn't really matter which one. So uh, that's not really going to fix your problems. The only reason that you have WPA1 or the original WPA uh, and you might even consider needing to go in and use it would be just for backwards compatibility for, by today's standards, some crazy old equipment. So if you need backwards compatibility back to stuff that's that old, go buy new stuff, okay? Because you're talking about some seriously old hardware. Um, WPA2 is what everybody should be using um, as far as anything that is 802.11 and you're going to use pre-shared keys. And so, uh, and of course, the enterprise solutions is a different topic, but don't, you, you, there's nothing about WPA1 that's going to make this more secure or WPA2 is going to make it more secure. Attacking the authentication exchange is going to be the same in both of those uh, particular instances or implementations. The last option on the list, which is also not correct, says none of the above, says that the encryption keys are ephemeral, therefore they're not attackable. Um, while there's some truth to the fact that the keys are ephemeral, um, it doesn't mean that the authentication exchange is not attackable. So you have to make sure that you distinguish between what's going on here. And this gets into some very kind of technical stuff, but um, every single user who connects to a wireless LAN that's using just, you know, sort of standard WPAPSK uses the same pre-shared key. That pre-shared key is used in addition to some other material to generate the actual encryption key. And that encryption key is ephemeral. It is a temporary key that is used for the duration of that user's connection. And then once the user disconnects from the wireless LAN, it's not used anymore. And every single user who's connected to a wireless LAN actually has a different encryption key, but they use the same pre-shared key in the process of generating that material. Um, because of that, the authentication exchange that is used, the four-way handshake in a wireless LAN connection, always uses the same pre-shared key to generate this thing called a pairwise master key. And that pairwise master key, if, if it can be recovered, can be used to validate whether or not we've actually figured out what the pre-shared key was. So the ephemeral nature of the actual key encryption key that's used, or the pairwise transient key as it's called, is not actually going to uh, protect you as far as somebody attacking the authentication exchange. So uh, th that, that particular option requires a, a fairly complex you know, understanding of what's actually going on, but um, it's not gonna defend, uh, or defend you or protect you in this scenario. So let's go back to where the real right answer is. And the, and the right answer really comes down to the question between saying that we're going to simply increase the size of the character set or we're going to increase the length of the actual uh, pre-shared key that we're using. Well, let me correct that, not pre-shared key, it's actually a passphrase that's used to generate uh, a, a key value. The best answer in this particular list of choices is for you to increase the, uh, the pre-shared key that you're using or the passphrase that you're using from 10 characters to 14 characters while still using the same character set just by using uppercase and lowercase characters. What this question is really about more than anything else is it's about password entropy and how strong is a particular password given a certain length and a certain character set. And uh, there's a link down below to a password entropy calculator in an article that I wrote on this trying to go in and explain exactly what goes on with password entropy and why it's relevant. But Password length uh, is a very important consideration when you're dealing with how, how hard it's gonna be for somebody to go in and figure out what your password is. Certainly the size of the character set is important. Now, if you were to take the time and actually go in and use the password entropy calculator that I've included a link to down in the, in the uh, comments below, what you'll see is that a 14 character password that uses just uppercase and lowercase uh, letters actually has 79 point something bits of entropy and a 10 character password that uses the entire character set not including a space only has around 65 point uh, some bits of uh, entropy. That is many orders of magnitude difference in terms of the uh, work that would have to be done to go in and actually brute force one of these keys. So even though a complex character set may seem like it's actually stronger using only 10 characters, using a longer uh, non-dictionary based password that 
um, is 14 characters long, even though it's a smaller character set, actually yields a stronger password that would be more challenging for somebody to attack offline. When you combine with this the fact that PBKDF2 is actually used, and that slows down the speed of the attack quite considerably, um, it shows that if you use a truly random 14 character passphrase that just uses uppercase and lowercase characters, it is stronger, significantly stronger, than a truly random 10 character uh, passphrase that uses the entire character set in terms of uppercase, lowercase numbers, and special characters, not including the space. Okay, uh, you'd add a little bit to it if you included the space for that. Okay, so um, take some time. Password entropy is a, is a very cool concept and it's something that I think a lot more people should be talking about in terms of their understanding of just how strong a password is or is not. Uh, and there's definitely some links down below that you should take some time to go in and read. All right, let's get my daughter back in here to bring this thing home. Go ahead and leave a like if you found this interesting and subscribe because we have these every single day and peace.